Um, so good morning. Uh, for the record, Jim Gamer, Best Council, uh, with the same date. Um, so before we go through the bill, we thought we go through a summary of the changes uh, for you. Uh, I'll, I'll stand here for a minute. Um, so um, the bill changes the regulatory oversight and administration from the previous bill. So um, the way I see at least there are five options you can go with in terms of oversight. One is to have joint oversight and rulemaking, which is the current law. Uh, second is to have separate oversight and separate rulemaking. That was the last draft we went through. So we have two parallel rules right in your line. Third is to separate oversight. Um, so AOE over public schools, HS over private, but have joint rulemaking. That's what this draft does. Um, Possible option is to have all oversight and rulemaking with AOE, and the fifth to have all oversight and rulemaking uh, by AHS. Okay, but this is the option that's been chosen for this draft here. Um, scrolling down, um, there is in this draft new ability of private programs, oh, it's not, sorry, up here, new requirement for public schools to notify contracted providers if the school plans to begin or expand pre-K, the pre-K program. So there's no requirement for a public school to get permission to expand, but there is a requirement in this bill for them to notify those private and public uh, providers that are contracted with that they do plan to begin or expand. So Kathleen, that was um, yeah, thank you. your suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. What, what's the timeline like within 30 days? 30 days. Within 30 days. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. We'll come to that. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then can you go to the Sure. Um, so there's a new requirement for the private programs to employ or contract um, for services with a qualified teacher to provide direct instruction. If you remember the last version we went through, it talked about the teacher providing direct instruction or supervi uh, supervising the staff at the facility. Um, so now we're saying direct instruction, but there's a new um, section that's in session law that gives um, kind of a three-year grace period or a lead time for a transition to happen. And in that time, um, the teacher would provide direct instruction or instructional coaching of the provider's staff. And we'll look at that. Um, and, and just, does anyone understand the difference between the grade books and session law? Good point. A refresher, okay. Um, so both uh, Green Books and Session Law is law, and it's um, they have equal weight. We tend to put things in the Green Books that have um, a value over time, meaning that we'll look back 20 years from now and want to see something. Um, something we might put in the um, session law in the, the white books up there um, are things that are um, of interest for a shorter period of time. For example, if there's a two-year report, we probably don't want that in the green books for the next 20 years, so we'll put that in session law. So in this case, because it's a three-year phase-in, um, it would be in session law because it's only of um, interest for the next three years. Um, Next, subsection, well, subsection B, so I used to say that, D. Um, there's a new ability of private programs to satisfy teacher qualification requirements by employing or contracting with a teacher that has a Montessori early childhood teacher certification. In the previous draft, we had um, teachers licensed under um, Chapter 51, um, and those are also in this draft, so this is an addition. And uh, in E, we have a new requirement for both agencies to post a list of providers under their respective jurisdictions that satisfy the program quality requirements, and for those providers to give notice if, for some reason, they no longer satisfy the program quality requirements. And then two more things. F, um, there's a new ability of school districts to adapt, adapt the uniform forms and processes developed by the Agency of Education to the circumstances. If compliance um, uh, with these uniform forms and processes would be unduly burdensome or costly to the school district. And lastly, there's a new provision that provides that school districts shall have no responsibility to monitor the administration of pre-K educational services provided by contracted providers 
and shall be immune from civil and criminal liability for their actions, which is part of the separation of oversight. So not only does a lead not have oversight over the privates, the public school districts don't have oversight over the privates either. The oversight is done by AHS. And this says you have to monitor them, and therefore you can't be held liable for not monitoring them. Okay, that's the summary. So let's come to the actual bill. Um, so we are here. Um, so a few small changes here um, to the statement of purpose. This is used to say eliminate joint administration by the two agencies. Now it's joint regulatory oversight because they still administer rules jointly. That's the change there. And then this language here about um, uniform forms of processes, uh, unless compliance with these uniform forms of processes would be unduly burdensome. That's, uh, I said, purpose now. Then, um, can you scroll for me? Uh, yeah. okay. So no changes here. Uh, pre-K pre uh, child is still defined the same way. Uh, so no change there. That goes to eligibility of five-year-olds. Same as before. Pre-K education, same as before. Um, private providers also the same as before. Yep. Um, that we're meeting the uh, program quality requirements that we're going to look at. It's regulated as a center-based child care program or family child care home by CDD. Oh, right. Ooh, I apologize. <laughs> 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 yeah, public provider faces the same, so it's full district that meets the program quality requirements. Uh, and then this Section here, um, access and number of hours is the same. So 10 hours, 35 weeks, uh, school district pays, the tui the, 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 makes the payment. All of this is the same as before. Um, we keep going down, but further, this all the same as before. And then you get to this. So this is where it says that if a district plans to begin or expand a public pre-K education program, it shall, not less than 30 days prior to the date of commencement or expansion of the program, no fine right in the public and private providers with which it has contracted to provide pre-K education. Um, I'm not exactly clear what that means uh, in in the real world, not less than 30 days prior to the date of commencement. Uh, so if you're commencing on a day certain, 30 days before that. I had in mind, um, I guess when we talked about this, I had in mind something um, a little bit more robust that would spark a community conversation about the expansion before it would be too late to, to really do anything. I mean, if, the, if a public program is going to expand on September 1, uh, and folks find out on August 1. It's a done deal at that point, isn't it? Joe, I guess this is more of a policy conversation. That conversation, too, just in terms of when, when that decision made that would probably be part of a budget, I would assume. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, probably part of a budget. Yeah, and the part. budget's passed in March. Yeah. And presented, what, was in November? So I, I think we could probably address our concern by maybe changing this to uh, something along the lines of within 30 days of it appearing on a school board agenda or something. Because the idea is to, is to alert people so you can have a conversation as to okay, what this potential means. impact gonna, is before it's uh, hit, hit the ground running. I'm going to flag that for further conversation. Perfect. Sounds good, Pat. <laughs> sure. The next section has to do with um, qualification of uh, both private and public programs. Um, so this is language that we looked at. That was last week. Um, so some similarities to the language we already looked at. A private provider has a national association for, um, for the education of young children accreditation, or four stars. 
And then where we're seeing a change, um, as I mentioned previously, is the language about employing or contracting with the services of a teacher. So right here on line 15 is where we see the language about providing direct instruction. At the end of the bill, we'll see the standalone section that gives that three-year window um, to also use coaching in addition to the direct instruction. Um, also, new language here is that in addition to being able to use a licensed and endorsed uh, teacher in early childhood education or early childhood special education, there's um, on line 18 also language that would allow a Montessori early childhood teacher certification to meet that particular qualification. This is related to the conversation we have. And then for a licensed public provider, uh, I've seen requirements as before, you have to employ a contract for the services of one qualified teacher uh, to provide direct instruction to pre-K students during the hours of operation of the program, uh, and the change here that to meet the safety and quality of the rules adopted by the state board. So this next set of language has to do with um, maintaining a list of uh, providers that are meeting the qualifications. So we have two paragraphs because now we have um, the two agencies with regulatory authority over their own programs. So we have HS in the first paragraph that's maintaining and posting on its website a list of private providers that satisfy quality requirements that we just looked at, the um, accreditation and the uh, teacher. And then the private provider that no longer satisfies one of more of these requirements is to notify AHS in writing and public providers with which it has contracted to provide pre-K education within five days after the event that makes it to no longer meet the qualification standards. And then we have similar language in B. Do you want to? Sure. Okay. Similar language, basically. So the agency of education has to post a list of the uh, public providers that satisfy the program requirements up here. And then likewise, uh, a public provider that um, public provider that, that no longer satisfies one more of these requirements from the primary the age of education and the public provider providers with which it has contracted to provide pre-K education. So remember that for public providers, um, you can um, you can have a relationship with a school district to another school district, right? So if you you, you send your child Versus district to another school district, the receiving district. If the receiving district has an issue with compliance, that receiving district has to notify the, the, the sending district. Uh, okay, so we um, this is in the, the tuition budget to ADM uh, section here. Nothing's not much has changed here because all the budgets and tuition stuff is the same as before, but. This language was struck in the last draft. It's been put back in. So now it says that um, on behalf of a resident pre-K child, the district should pay tuition for pre-K education for 10 hours per week for 35 weeks annually to a private provider or to a public provider. And it's not the child's district of residence provider. However, the district should pay tuition for weeks that are within the district's academic year. And where are we here? Uh, okay, this is the uniform form. So this requires, as before, AOE to, um, sorry, school districts to use the uniform forms and processes developed by AOE, but new language says, notwithstanding that, a school district may adapt their uniform forms and processes developed by the AOE to its circumstances if compliance of these uniform forms and processes would be unduly burdensome or costly to the school district. And then here, this is language we had before about uh, the SU having a policy to monitor uh, the um, member of district's uh, pre-K programs. Okay. This is new. Uh, school district that pays to... Yeah. Um, so, um, so um, on line 18... 18. Yeah. Yeah, just the board. Um, so when it says the pro uh, public of private providers, pre-kindergarten education programs. So these uh, standards, the Bell standards on pre-K to grade three are, are supposed to be implemented 
in the pre-K. And I'm just wondering if the agency could monitor that to make sure that they are being implemented. We have the agency coming in okay. um, on a variety of topics. Um, I think we can because I, I think they, that. they're required to implement them. So I'll put a flag on that. Great. One. Thank you. <laughs> okay. This is the school district that pays tuition for pre-K education under this section shall be responsible for ensuring that the provider is on the list maintained by the agency of human services or the agency of education, um, but shall have no responsibility to monitor the administration of pre-K educational services provided by the public or private provider and shall be immune from civil and criminal liability and penalties for the acts or omissions of the public or private provider's administration of pre-K educational services. So I just want to make sure I understand it. So each agency will have the ultimate responsibility for ensuring that, that the programs qualify and putting a list up, and all the districts will have to do going forward is check and make sure they're on the list. And have a contract. You have to have right. a contract. Yep. But the contract will include like monitoring, the oversight monitoring, right? That's which it will be basically a tuition payment contract. Um, and, and remember that you know, um, if you have 10 school districts, all saying one child to a pre-K program. Yep. Currently, the, all 10 of those have to monitor that pre-K program. Right. Right? And this basically says no. Yeah. That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is just to make sure they're on the list. And pay money. And pay money. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. And this next subdivision um, is meant to articulate where the regulatory oversight lies. So in the first paragraph, we have that AOE has the sole regulatory oversight of pre-K programs offered by the public providers. Um, and if the public provider participates in CCFAP, there's a carve out here that says AHS is to have regulatory oversight of that provider's compliance with CCFAP. And then um, similarly in subdivision 1B, um, DCF has sole regulatory oversight over pre-K programs offered by a private provider. So that's a new subdivision. Um, this previously had just been a rule section, so now regulatory oversight and rules. And then on line 17 um, is where we get into the rules that had existed previously. So as Jim mentioned when we we're going through the overview, this is where we start to see where we have the two sets of regulatory oversight, but we have one consistent set of rules. So on line 17, in order to ensure the consistent application of rules to public and private providers, we have the Secretary of Education and Commissioner of DCF jointly developing rules. So that is the, the status quo now, the joint development of rules. And also just clarifying that if the public school has a um, uh, wraparound child care and they're accepting PC fat money that they also will fall under um, oversight by AHS. If it's in a public program, it's going to be dual oversight for for the private for the for the uh, after pre-K hours. So, you know, Townsend has a, has a wraparound child care within the school system, and they accept CC that money. So that would that would be a time where you would have in a public school joint oversight, correct? Yeah. But only only to the extent of. AHS having oversight to make sure program requirements for the CFAP are right. compliant with whatever they are. So it's not broader than that. Well, are you asking if a, like a separate child care vendor is um, a provider is coming in for after hours? No. My, You're well, just talking about the CFAP. There are sometimes, mm -hmm. um, there are so many different varieties of, mm -hmm. of interpretation here. Some are offering uh, after school care and actually it's the paraeducators that are in the classroom and they're continuing on with the program but it's they can accept money for that because it's child care it's not pre-k and they're accepting money for it um, in some they have a private provider that comes in at certain time and, and provides for it. So there are a lot of different variations, variations um, that can happen within a school building. So that would be a case where 
these, we'll call it after school because it's just easier to say, <laughs> um, that would be oversight by AHS. That would be my understanding. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, so next we move to the first rulemaking requirement, and this is just kind of rewriting existing law um, to permit private providers that would otherwise be qualified as private providers but for um, non-compliance with the provision on the um, licensed teacher piece. So they either have the accreditation um, through the uh, NACI or um, four stars, but they don't have um, the licensed teacher. So then we're existing language. They can um, create new or continue partnerships with um, the school districts to provide teacher support. Um, here we have language um, uh, previously said to require that um, <laughs> school district provides opportunities for effective parental par participation. We've just cleaned up that language, public and private providers. Um, sorry, I just, I, I got a little bit mixed up. So on page 11, um, where was C1A again? Is that to come? Uh, C1A2. Yeah. So, um, that is the piece about licensed teachers and private providers. So in other words, what this lead in language is saying um, is that for a, a private provider that would be qualified as a private provider, but for the fact that they don't have that licensed teacher piece, meaning they either have the accreditation or the four stars, that those are the um, private providers that we're allowing to create new or continue existing partnerships with school districts, which makes sense because they don't have that um, licensed teacher component. Um, so we clean up. We're still moving through the rules. Um, what is this? Um, thank you. So we have rulemaking, existing rulemaking language of district. Um, can enter into an agreement with any provider to which it will pay tuition. And so we're removing language about quality assurance, transition, and other matters. Um, and that goes to what we're saying. We have the separate regulatory authorities um, looking at this. Um, okay. In H, um, we have language about establishing comparable systems by which the two um, regulatory entities are monitoring and evaluating, but they're not jointly monitoring and evaluating. It's just um, parallel or comparable systems. Um, so they're monitoring and evaluating the implementation of publicly funded pre-K education under their respective jurisdictions. That's keeping with what we've already heard. Um, we do have a joint report of the results of the evaluations, though. So the two, we have um, AOE and AHS reporting together on that piece, even though they have um, otherwise um, separate authority. We have more redesignation here. Um, language, uh, collect and report child progress data to the Secretary of Education and the Commissioner of Children and Families. That just refers to the fact that we're having separate jurisdictions and they're each collecting um, their own information. Um, and on line three, subdivision J, we're still looking at rulemaking authority and joint rules. Um, and we're looking at language about establishing safety and quality requirements for public and private providers. That has to be part of the rules. And we'll look at language a little bit later on in the bill that talks about um, which standards to use when we're looking at safety um, requirements. So on um, um, line one, I'm wondering this, this, how does this relate to Serena's question about um, progress monitoring? Like one, one, V2 there. V2? Yeah, okay. Still V2. Um, I just wanted to pull up the lead in language. Oh, okay. um, so this is language we looked at before, but so this is existing language about rulemaking. Uh, we're establishing a process for documenting the progress of children enrolled in pre-K to require public and providers to use the process to individualize instruction, improve program practice, and we're collecting and reporting data to both um, departments on an annual basis. So this is not 
so prescriptive in that it, well, it's it's telling what the process is. They're it's delegating authority to the agencies to determine what their process will be for monitoring and collecting that type of information. Does that answer your question? Well, I'll tell you what I'd like to have happen. I think it's required mm -hmm. that um, pre-K this this these standards mm -hmm. are um, implemented in pre-K, and I just want to make sure they are. So I don't know how to word that. I would assume this would do that. I don't know if that's the current language. So you want to know if the process is going to take into account whether the quality standards of pre-K are being followed. Well, I think they, they're supposed to be followed. Uh -huh. OK, so it's not like implementing something new. It's just making sure that what is supposed to be happening is happening. I'm seeing an agency flying that, that might have a comment here. And just For the record, yeah. Ted Fisher, Ryan, the State of Education, we'll just, we'll, we're going to be coming in next yeah. week. We'll make sure we give you a good update on the bells and okay, how perfect. we follow up with them. And then you can Great. let us know if you think it should change. Thank you. Thank OK, you. thank you. And we have one last subdivision here, and that is that in adopting these rules, um, ALE, the Board of Education, and DCF are, uh, are to seek to ensure that the rules that apply to public and private providers are aligned. But there's language here that says, to the extent that there are compelling reasons that are unique to either of these settings, um, that we could apply differences in the two sets of standards. So we're kind of saying the intent is to keep them as closely aligned as possible, but recognizing that there might be um, differences that would justify having um, separate requirements. And then uh, the language. Oh, Oops, I'm sorry. The language here hasn't changed, so F is the same, which is uh, supplying the other tuition uh, provisions of, of Title 16. Limitations around uh, separation of church and state hasn't changed. And geographical limitations haven't changed either. So in this bill, we can still, uh, just this we can still create geographical regions, if you will. Right. Right. Um, and they can set them any way that they. Well, if there's a process here, process. Right, yeah. uh, to do that, but yeah. yeah. And that's in place now, anyway. Yeah. Can we? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then this is um, CC Fab. Okay, um, so this language hasn't changed since the last time you've seen it. But um, basically, we have a, a subsection A that says we need a license in order to have um, a, a child care program. Um, and then there, are in subsection B, a list of exceptions. And we're saying that a public provider pre K is one of the exceptions. Um, unless the provider participates in CCFAP, and we've already seen similar language that aligns with this. The section hasn't changed. It's a, a clean up again on the definition of uh, pre K, uh, sorry, early childhood education. Again, this goes to eligibility for five year olds. Same language as, as last draft. <coughs> um, so, what's the language that you Yep. And then uh, section four um, has a change requires a AOE or the secretary to develop the uniform forms and processes um, to be used by school districts. Um, and then section five has a change requires the secretary to develop the model pre-K monitoring policy for SUs to use. Section six is um, what I referred to earlier. This is language that says the safety and quality requirements required to be adopted, joint uh, adoption for pre-K shall be aligned with rules that DCF applies to private providers for pre-K education, unless, again, there are compelling reasons to justify separate um, um, regulations. So um, this particular section is new, but the concept was in the previous draft that we're following um, CDC's um, safety requirements. <laughs> And the next section, this is the language that provides that three-year period with which private providers um, transition from 
being allowed to use coaching um, to coming into a model where they would just have direct instruction by a teacher for the um, publicly funded hours. So the specific language says, even though, so notwithstanding, even though earlier in the draft we say you have to have direct instruction um, of, um, for the publicly funded hours, um, the pre-K provider um, employed or contracted for the services of at least one qualified teacher to provide direct educational instruction. A pre-K provider may use the services of the teacher to provide either direct instruction to pre-K students or coaching to the provider staff or both until the start of the 2023-2024 school year. And then when we start that school year and thereafter, the private pre-K provider is to comply with the teaching requirements that say direct instruction is the only acceptable use of the um, teacher. And then what we kind of highlighted here is um, maybe a, a policy direction or a a question for the committee. So there are two ways of, um, what we want to do is, is provide instruction about what coaching is. So there's one option where we just reference um, a, um, agency of education guidance, and that's the first bracketed sentence, a pre-K provider that uses the services of a qualified teacher to provide instructional coaching to the provider's staff shall use, for shall use for this purpose the guidelines implementing effective coaching systems issued by AOE as of March of 2016. Alternatively, um, we pulled language from that document to just drop in a definition of coaching. Um, so as used in this section, coaching means the practice of endeavoring to close the student achievement gap and accelerate learning for all students by building teacher capacity through implementation of effective instructional practices, including the provision of ongoing, embedded, non-evaluative professional learning. So kind of two approaches there. And then, and then we'll, we'll ask people from the field. Um, that would be a good question for people from the field in terms of which they're going to be more useful. So just a clarifying question. So this is because it's pre-K, pre-4, five-year-olds, um, and not one, one year. I'm assuming that that teacher would be teaching three, four, and five-year-olds. And if there's more than, let's say there's 50 or 30 three, four, and five-year-olds, mm -hmm. is a, is a um, class size that is kind of that the school has set up for the maximum class size, does that, does that apply to this situation? Like if there's 30 kids and the public school says the class size of kindergarten is, I don't know, 15 or something, mm -hmm. do you need additional teachers if so, they go over the... I'm not familiar with the ratios in the public school system. What I can tell you is that the rules um, for the private program that govern health and safety and set forth mm -hmm. ratios, that would apply to this setting. So do you know the ratios? The oh, not off the top of my head. They're, they're pretty 30, yeah. 10 to 1, that yeah. sounds right. The two-year-old is maybe 1 to 5. Mm -hmm. Or one. Well, so under two. Eight. I think it's one to four. One to four. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I can get that for you, the okay. specific so ratios. remember, in the public school, they're always being taught by a licensed teacher. Right. At all times. Right. So if we're, uh, if we're requiring a licensed teacher to be teaching, right, or coaching. In the private. In the private. Do the same requirements for the public school. The ratios would fall under the private rules, which are much okay. stricter. Okay. And it, that would, would mean, so it could be the classroom has 15 children in it. Mm -hmm. There has to be one classroom teacher, but you could also have a paraeducator. It's in terms okay. of, that's a more of a safety thing in terms of making yep. sure you have an appropriate. Yep. I just um, didn't know if yeah. we needed a teacher for every 10 kids, a licensed teacher for every 10 kids. <laughs> we need a licensed teacher, but, well, I'll let you explain. I think we need a licensed teacher for teaching those children, but in terms of the number, you have to have appropriate number of personnel in, but they don't all have to be licensed teachers. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So that would cover that if they were, let's say, 30 or 25. If you have, like, three paraeducators and one licensed teacher, let's just say, mm -hmm. that would cover that. 
if, if the ratio is one to ten, then yes, then that would cover that. It doesn't have to be three licensed okay. teachers under this. It's one licensed teacher for the public program. Hundred hours. Okay. Yeah. Then we have people that will be coming in that can clarify that and give us the precise. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm seeing smiling people that have that information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It might have been there, but I, I don't remember. There was something about um, when pre-K could happen, and there was the question of whether it could happen any time or within the school year. Did we address that? We did, yeah. We okay. that language, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm unstruck. So we're back to the original, original language. Okay. current language and statute yeah. says what this now says, which is it has to be during the academic year of the school district. I have um, put out a request to get um, testimony. I'll just tell you who I've asked and if there are some others that you want. I've, I'm asking um, the AOE, CDD. I'm asking the Vermont Association of School Board uh, School Business Officers. I'm asking Let's Grow Kids. Um, we'll be asking the VEs, as we call it, <laughs> to testify, to uh, put out questions related to just comments on the current draft. Um, then thoughts about addressing the double fingerprint in the background checks, because we have not yet solved that problem. That still exists. I think what we figured is that in terms of the double fingerprinting in the privates, it would only affect the teacher who would have to get double fingerprinted. And if they were paraeducators in the school working in a private program, they'd have to be double. So, so we're, we're reaching out to see if there's a way that we can address that or not. But at least so far, it reduces a lot of people that work. Um, and we have um, questions out related to um, what happens if AOE or CDG receives a complaint, or did we handle that? We, well, that's a very good topic, so we yeah. didn't ha handle that. Yeah. Um, let's actually look at that for a second, because there's a reason why we didn't handle it. Um, yeah. Which is, let's find it. <clears throat> okay, so on uh, lines eight through 15 here, requires that it be joint rulemaking to provide and administrative process for uh, a parent, guardian, or provider to challenge an action of a school district or the state when the complainant believes that the district or state is in violation of state statute or rules regarding pre-K education, and a school district to challenge an action of a provider or the state, uh, likewise, when it believes uh, there's a violation. So there's already, this is current, current, language and statute. So there's already a current requirement to have rules that address uh, a grievance process. And there are, I believe there are issues with how that's working today. Before changing this language, I think you have to find out what's, what the problems are. Um, so I didn't put a new grievance process in because there already is one um, in statute. Okay. Yeah. Um, and another thing we, were, we, we had an interest in, we were talking with in terms of um, some of the invoicing, we had an interest in finding out how is some of this working. We thought, oh, good, everybody can use the same dates, but then find out that um, different school districts have different software and that's a complicated thing. So that's one of the things we thought we'd have to go about. Um, is there anybody else that you would want to make sure we hear from in relation to moving forward? Will yeah. we get a JFO? We have we don't have any money in this at the moment. So adding making sure a licensed teacher as opposed to a coach is giving direct instruction that doesn't increase the cost? That doesn't affect the general fund or, or the end fund directly. So if we're not at we, we get a fiscal note if we're asking for some money. Okay. And that that, asking that money. goes up to the yeah. However, the one th question we have not addressed and we have had a conversation about um, expanding 
uh, providing some kind of um, grants or, or support for districts to cons or for regions to consider um, looking at a, a pre-K coordinator. Um, that's a topic that's still under discussion. I don't think we've really fleshed out what we want to do with that yet, um, whether we just let it happen organically or whether we start to look at, oh, I know, I spoke with, <coughs> spoke with, uh, I think, the um, superintendents that they might be able to use our map and point out uh, where we have um, pre-K coordinators. Which I think would be very helpful in saying where are your holes. Yeah. I think we probably could. I think it would be very helpful. Yeah. Um, particularly if we could look at it in terms of there's one pre-K coordinator for this area, then here's another area, and there's one for this entire supervisor union, one for the supervisor union, and one for the supervisor union. And that's what Meg was. Meg was right. Meg yeah. was one for for the three districts and. Yes, and um, also Sandra was one for 12 supervisory units at some point, so. So, uh, I'm not sure we're going to Oh, yes, um, is Kelly. Kelly Payola, for yeah. the record. Uh, I do have a question, actually, about talking to JFO about potentially running some numbers, um, and I'm not sure how complicated it would be, but if the new requirements are going to be to have licensed teachers in private programs providing direct instruction. Um, and I think some of the drive behind that is improving quality. And I also think there's, I hope there's an expectation that those um, licensed teachers would be able to be paid in a more similar fashion to teachers in public settings. I, I, that's certainly a part of the conversation, it seems like. Um, the increase in salaries to those teachers in private programs uh, would drive up tuition rates at private providers, uh, which not knowing exactly how the amount of tuition that gets sent to private providers is calculated, I that increase in tuition rates might affect that number. I'm not sure, because I don't know what the math looks like. But it would certainly affect how much CCFAT money qualified families would be getting, because those rates are um, market rates. And even though we've not done a good job at keeping up with what the current market rates are, if tuition costs continue to climb, um, the cost to the CCFAT program will continue to climb. So I know it doesn't fall under the Ed Fund, but it's it's going to happen somewhere it, in the private provider world. Um, if you would like to sort of organize that question. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's, like, it's, it's a big Organize that question. Yeah. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> send it to me, and I, and I will, you can send it to, to me and to Mark. Okay. And we can certainly um, take a look at, at that. But just to clarify, yeah. we're not asking, this bill is to change the number of required hours that a licensed teacher be present. But if you're requiring that a licensed teacher be in each classroom providing direct instruction for all of those 10 hours, that's a big change from what is currently happening in some programs oh, I, I, now. I know what you're saying. So if it's like a center where the licensed person teaching. might be the director. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now you're going to have to have a classroom for those it, hours. Yeah. Okay. So for example, the ones that, that we visited, um, um, there were so many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in Northeast Kingdom, there yes. had a building with oh, probably five yeah. different programs going on at one time. Mm -hmm. Right. So. And if you have multiple, if you have, if but somewhere has enough students that they have a classroom for three-year-olds and a classroom for four-year-olds, then each program is going to have to have two licensed teachers, and they may not be doing that So, so right Kelly, now. is your question trying to quantify if the private's costs go up and they're required to raise their tuition and pass that cost along to parents? Uh-huh. So, so if I'm with you, mm -hmm. then what will the impact 
Then I lost the thread. What will the impact be on the amount of tuition that is coming out of the Ed Fund for those vouchers? Uh -huh. How is that calculated and do the market rates affect what that end result is? Mm -hmm. And then how will that affect the market rates for CC FAP subsidies? So should the value of the voucher go up accordingly? Is that what you're asking? Um, I guess that's a question. Or a should that go up accordingly? Or should you just rely on the CCFAP subsidy to cover that presumed increase? Um, keeping in mind that not everybody qualifies for CCFAP money. Right. I'm going to suggest that uh, we, set up, we set up a private conversation with Mark mm -hmm. to kind of give him, get him a little bit oriented on what mm -hmm. we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and Happy to help you. So, mm -hmm. I just have to remind you. I need it. I will. Back to you. Well, the cabinet is limited up here. <laughs> um, no. Okay, other people? I, I, I think we're starting to get closer. Are people, how are people reacting to what we're doing so far? Are we going in the right direction? I'm comfortable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not highly complicated. We haven't thrown anything to it that's significant, so I think that's really going to help us we go, we so go through this. Uh, the goal, again, at least my goal, was to stabilize um, and give us a chance to move forward uh, as opposed to throwing in anything really exciting and new. We need that for another body. Um, thank you very much. And please thank Katie for us as well. Um, I haven't figured out how we address the idea of, of, um, of pre-K coordinators, um, but I think that's a conversation that just needs to happen outside the room, and so we can organize what that question is. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to continue on. We'll get more testimony. Um, I know that the AOE is working on coming in, and I know we've got the bees here. We've got some color bees. Um, I've also got a question into the AOE related to special ed. We have two problems that were occurring. One is a bill that's on the wall that Carolyn Partridge um, brought in relation to um, special ed funding for, for children in pre-K. And then we have another one that apparently is a challenge that's up in Cambridge to just help us understand a little bit better um, how special ed funding goes. I don't see a solution right now to how we address serving children who are outside of the district. Um, I don't see anybody has that one yet. Okay, we have a break. Um, I have Nick Levinson, who is the author of the DMG report. Um, he's going to Skype in with us related to what we're working on um, literacy in our shift to um, build from the um, DMG report um, addressing the concern about, about literacy and capacity at the local level. So. Um, just going to be an opportunity to talk with him. Uh, take us a little bit off the road that we've been on, uh, moving to a little bit broader scope in how we're looking at literacy and how it relates to DMG. This is an opportunity for us to step a little bit out of the reading wars that we have all had a chance to participate in pretty deeply, um, but at the same time to continue on with the work that we really need to do to do with the fact that we're well aware that our reading scores are a challenge and that children aren't progressing to the degree that we would think that they certainly could. So you're on break, and unless there's anything else anybody wants to talk about. Thank you so much, Dr. Levinson. We so appreciate your time. Um, Kate Webb, the, the Chair of House Education, I was the ranking member when you presented your report. Uh, students who need additional support. I think that there are five of us that were here then, and the other six are new to that. So I'm just going to have my members introduce themselves. 
Okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dylan Giambattista from Essex Junction. I'm Caleb Elder from Starksboro. Sarita Austin from Colchester. <clears throat> Chris Maddows, Milton. Larry Cooper, Rockland City. Kathleen James, Manchester. Casey Toof, St. Albans. Lynn Bachelor from the Northeast Kingdom, Derby. And also in the room, we have um, a, a member of the Principals Association. Hey, Nate, Jay's here. Jay's there, yeah. Hi, <laughs> Nate. Good to see you, bud. And we have um, a representative from the Agency of Education. Uh, Kate Kizzo. And we have a representative from the Teachers mm -hmm. Association. Colin Robinson. And a member from the Superintendents Association. Hi, Nate, it's Chelsea. And then, of course, we have Avery, who keeps us keeps us sane. Pretty much as well. <laughs> so, thank you so much. We are, you we, we so appreciated the work that you did um, in helping us figure out how we're going to address the needs of our, our students in the additional support. And we took to heart your recommendation that we put a focus on literacy. Um, to that effect, we found ourselves uh, entering into the, re we were on the battlefield of the reading wars, um, which I'm sure you know plenty about. Um, and we are now sort of backing off from some of the language in terms of, you know, what we were looking at to actually looking at literacy in terms of the recommendations that you, you made. Um, much of which in, really involves getting the, the, the sustained coaching um, in the schools on um, what it takes to deliver a, a quality. Have, we, our test scores are not very good um, for our state, so that, that's a, a motivation. But what it is that we can do to get the, the sustained coaching in the schools to enhance our literacy instruction. So I guess I'd look at you for some guidance. At the moment, I think we're a little bit focused on the idea of grants to districts. Um, and uh, looking at, you know, um, helping um, picking the right criteria to choose the schools that are the, excuse me, are not schools, <coughs> regions. <laughs> We're looking at regional support. Um, we're too small to do schools and school school uh, districts, but looking at regional uh, support. Um, and we're looking at the idea of consultants to help regions uh, uh, develop systems. Um, and I guess I'm just looking to you to give us some guidance on how we might get that support on the ground in our, in our in our schools. Sure. I'm um, happy to uh, continue this conversation and appreciate the opportunity. I think a couple framing hunts, uh, uh, points I'd like to make, which uh, go as follows. One is when we first shared our findings, go back uh, a while now, these were pretty big changes. And I don't want to undermine or short shrift that these were recommendations to do things quite differently for reasons that are historically interesting, which I won't dive into, um, working across the entire state of Vermont, um, there was not nearly the focus on what we call core instruction, that tier one, that thing that every student gets. And within that focus, um, just being really frank and very respectful, literacy wasn't treated as paramount as it was in most other cities. Um, that was the first kind of big fight that I want you to keep in your mind. The second is that when districts did think and value and prioritize literacy, because some certainly did, they overwhelmingly prioritized support in very, very small groups delivered by not particularly highly skilled teachers, not people who are you know, struggling students weren't being supported by the strongest teachers, in many cases, people who aren't teachers at all. Um, in the time since we have shared those findings in dozens and dozens of forums, uh, there has been a groundswell of desire to move in this direction. Uh, more so than I've seen almost anywhere. I've worked in 28 
maintained over 200 school systems. And I, I want to acknowledge that we ask people to make bigger changes than usual. And we're at a stage now where superintendents, principals, special ed directors, many teachers are saying, hey, these are the really good things that we want to do. So I want to acknowledge that we're in a very powerful place and there are a lot of folks who want to go here. And that's half the battle. The other thing I want to point out is that, as you know, you have lots of small districts. Your largest districts are small compared to everybody else. And these are big lists. Um, with central offices and school leadership teams that are stretched very thin. So I say that, or my belief is that you have very willing parties who want to go here. What they lack is manpower, capacity, support. So it's not a lack of interest. It's just very small teams or at very full place. Uh, the third point I want to make is in, in our interview, and in, you know, we spent over 40 days traveling across the state interviewing teachers. Um, everybody told us the following. We're so glad you came to my school because we are so different than every other school in the state. <laughs> and everybody in my team would call me you know, and say, hey, another place said they're so different from everybody else. They're not. Um, there are, a, yes, there are differences, but there are a lot of commonalities. So we really believe that the efficiency and the, the support should be, as you mentioned, across multiple districts. Uh, it's not school by school or district by district. And there is enough common need and enough common interest that's going to be better. And the last thing I want to acknowledge is that this is as much a political challenge and a funding challenge, and I'll talk about all those in a moment, as it is as a technical, hey, this is good practice, go do it. Um, but the three things that have to change, and this is where I am finally going to answer your question of what to look for and who might you want to support. The three things that have to change is, yes, we've got to change practice in the classroom. Um, if you want to look for schools and districts that, that believe in those changes, and we think there are many, many, many that are out there. Once you believe in those changes, two other things are going to have to happen, or a number of things are going to have to happen. One is you're going to need to spend your dollars differently. Not more money, but differently. And that is a, that's a political question as much as it is an economic question. Are you willing to invest in highly skilled teachers? Are you willing to invest in um, highly skilled uh, literacy coaches? Um, are you willing to, through attrition, reduce the reliance on uh, paraprofessionals? Are you willing to cross the boundaries and think about not just special ed or general ed, but all kids who struggle more holistically? And so if you've got districts that are both philosophically on board, but also willing to shift their funds, that would be the second uh, criteria I would be looking for. So that's sort of accelerate these improvements. Um, and then the third would be uh, districts that are willing to do this for the long haul. This is not a come in for three months or six months and train some people and disappear. This is a systemic change. It is a change that it probably took you 20 to 25 years to get where you are. Uh, these are kinds of changes that take a couple of years. It doesn't mean you can't start making change in a few months. So these are two to three year efforts and we're looking for places um, that are committed over the long term. Let me pause there for some questions or go deeper in any places you'd like. I'm going to turn to my committee members. And I actually, given the people that we have in the room, I'm going to open it up for you to ask questions mm -hmm. as well. So if you have a question, please let me know. Anything so far from, from us, from the members? Um, when you say change practice, could you just expand on that just a little? Sure. Um, right now, and I'm going to overgeneralize, but we did look at, you know, we interviewed you know, over 500 staff, we 
we got schedules from over a thousand people. What we saw as a practice was that if I'm a classroom teacher, um, for the classroom teachers to hold us themselves over and over again, they are not 100% sure how to reach all of their students. So when you've got two thirds of your kids in the state read on grade level. So we know how to teach two thirds of the kids. The teachers are saying, I'm not sure what to do for the other third. They want to, but they said they're not sure. Um, what they do seem to do when they're not sure is send them to special ed, send them to a prior professional, or take an intervention, extra help with the solution. Um, those are not, that's not the right game plan. Um, Winston Churchill, I believe, said the difference between a riddle and an enigma is that a riddle has an answer. In 2020, we have, and I don't mean we, but the world has figured out how to teach reading. The National Reading Panel, the World Works Square House, the NE Casey Foundation, there is a set of practices that work for most students. Uh, that knowledge is not widely known across the state. So that's, so that's what I mean by changing the practices. Now, that is both the core instruction, what, which is what everybody gets, then you're also going to have to support that with intervention, extra help. And it's not one or the other. And we saw too much rush to intervention and not enough focus um, on getting that foundational instruction where it needed to be. Thank you. Yeah. Nate, I, I apologize. I'm going to bring you into the bigger battle over reading. But you said there's a set of practices that work for most students. Are you talking about structured literacy? Um, so the practices that work for most students uh, typically goes under the name of balanced literacy. Um, it says that um, all kids need to be explicitly taught and screened for phonemic awareness. That is how they process sounds. They need to be taught phonics. And yes, that was part of that literacy war of whether phonics is an ugly word or not. Phonics is important. It is not the end all, but it's a necessary ingredient. We need to explicitly teach fluency. We need to explicitly teach uh, vocabulary. And you need to explicitly teach comprehension. When you do those five things, mm -hmm. Most kids will learn to read. Uh, there are different ways of teaching those things, uh, but the ingredients need to be there. They need to be taught well. And I think maybe the biggest shift is to recognize that teaching kids to read, particularly kids who are struggling, that is a very high and specialized skill. We, we as adults, we all read. And I read at a college level. But I am not actually able to teach a third grader how to read. I don't have that training. And I think acknowledging that the teacher skill is really important is part of that um, <coughs> of those best practices. And, and at least my sense is, you know, I've we've done a lot of work in the state. I have as we said, we've worked with maybe 30 or maybe even 40 districts across the state now. We are seeing very widespread support uh, for moving in this direction. I think what we're also seeing is people saying, hey, we want to go here, but this is hard. We need some help. But at least I don't want to underplay the difficulty, but I don't think there's a philosophical objection to this direction. I think there's just a, a plea for support to help us get there. Other questions from the room? Jay, Chelsea? Nate, if, if there were, oh, sorry. So Chelsea, yeah. <laughs> Chelsea Myers, VSA. Nate, if there were um, any support in the form of money, um, how would you suggest assessing regions for the allocation of those funds? Um, so I, I do think that um, creating cohorts of school systems that are moving in this direction is helpful. Um, you know, again, it's from an economic point of view, it's just 
is expensive to help one district as good as 10, and we want to be cost effective. But I think from the um, adaptive change, it's actually easier to help 10 than one. You know, I used to be a superintendent. Uh, there's, I think, a saying that uh, the nail that stands up gets hammered down. If I'm the first one and the only one to move in this direction, that can bring a lot of attention, not in a good way. But if 10 districts said, hey, we really want to do it because it's the right thing, that actually makes it easier. Um, I think the other question about how you form uh, cohorts is some, because I mentioned half jokingly but half seriously, that um, everybody thinks they're unique. Allowing people to perhaps opt into a, uh, some districts who are serving more kids in poverty would probably prefer to be in a cohort with other districts that have similar demographics and districts that are serving more middle class or affluent communities would probably prefer. Now they both need help, but I think they themselves might self-select cohorts that are are more similar to themselves. And so that's something they want to think about. Um, I, I think the question for you all is how do you assess the willingness to make meaningful change? Uh, because that's what we're looking for. Um, and again, I believe it is out there. Uh, I, I think that would be important because this is perceived as both the general ed and the special ed effort. So you want to see uh, real commitment and participation voted by whoever is in charge of general ed teaching and learning and whoever is in charge of special education. Uh, it's a joint effort. Uh, certainly you want to see a commitment and active participation by the superintendent. Uh, this kind of change just doesn't happen without a superintendent's support. Um, that's what I would be looking for. Yes, Colin from the NEA, yes. Hi, Dave. Um, based upon your experience, whether it's regionally or nationally, but also with the districts you've worked in Vermont, you alluded to kind of we got here over the course of several decades. What type of time horizon in your experience is needed to uh, realize the systems change that you're uh, envisioning here? Um, in a way that is sustainable and practical for uh, all parties involved? Sure. Um, great question. And we were very upfront when we first made our report and we struck by this. This is a two to three year implementation. It will continue for three to five years, but I think a solid two to three years of implementation. I think that um, it has to be done with teachers, not to teachers. Um, the teachers we met want to move in this direction, but they want and need and deserve help and support. That's where you know coaching, that's where looking at schedules, that's where um, there are no villains or bad guys in this. But the teachers told us that or they all have a number of kids, they're not sure what to do, um, or what to avoid. Let me be uh, fairly definitive on this. This may offend some people. But here's what not to do. Uh, what we refer to as sit and get professional development, where a very smart person, could be me, could be somebody else, comes in, there's a lot of teachers in the room, and we tell them what to do. Now, mind you, I know what to tell them. I mean, we know what the National Freedom Panel says. We know what we're staring at says. But we can talk to teachers, tell them what to do, and then send them on their way and hope it'll happen. That isn't how change of this magnitude happens. So what you need to do is, yes, share these practices with teachers, but then provide coaching support. You need to be able to provide regular you know, uh, forms for teachers to say, hey, I tried this, but it's not working. Help me. Uh, you need to have teachers tell you, and they will, hey, I'm doing my part, but we don't have enough reading teachers, so we don't have a schedule that allows for intervention, or our IEPs aren't supporting this. It is a systems change where teachers need to be regularly consulted to hear what they need, and then the kind of support you want to be providing 
has to include helping people rewrite IEPs when appropriate, redo schedules when needed. Um, if there's a missing link in this, or a weak link in this effort, there's no partial credit. That's the one thing I should have mentioned is those best practices I shared, if you do some of them but not all of them, you don't get some of the benefit. And, and I think where often we find not the places we work, if the superintendent isn't part of the process, if teachers aren't part of the process, if I uh, special ed's not part of the process, there ends up being a missing or weak link or two. And then people get very frustrated because if you're saying, hey, I should be doing this, I'll give you one example. Um, all kids should get 90 minutes of instruction in reading. You can't be pulling a student out for a speech and language during reading. Kids who struggle uh, need extra time to learn from highly skilled teachers. Well, if I don't have any of those in my building, what am I supposed to do? So it really is a process where you go in and you look at what ingredients are there, what ingredients are missing, work through the staffing, the budgeting, the scheduling, to get all those ingredients there. The most frustrating thing you can do is to put half the pieces in place, ask the teachers to do it, and then they get angry and we get disappointed that things aren't changing. Well, we could have forecast they weren't going to change because not all the pieces were there. And so that's why it's multi-year, it's why it's a systems thinking approach, why it's more than just during a lecture, and it's why we need that very regular feedback um, on the folks on the front lines. Um, the School Boards Association. Yes, Heather Cameron. Hi, Nate. Um, my uh, question is about uh, development of an assessment of the systems, and if you could you speak to use of the DMG report to develop a system of assessment? Sure. Um, so there is a very, as I said, the good news is wriggle that in a pot. We know what to look for. We know what to be in place. Um, I, I think that there are. The ability to create, say, a, a tool that says, do you or don't you have these elements is relatively straightforward. Uh, the caution I would have, and again, there are ways to do this cost effectively, it is hard to self assess. So I'm just, I know this is very, this will surprise nobody coming from a consultant, but I was actually a superintendent on the other side of the table most of my life. <coughs> People do, there's a lot of research that says people overestimate how much, what they're actually doing. But I think the question is, how do you create a self-assessment, but also some kind of low-cost, rapid, external review, um, confirmation, or pushback? It's just, hey, you, if you're doing phonics, if you're doing it 10 minutes a week, and when we said product, we meant 20 minutes a day. And so it, I think you want to be cautious about it. completely relying on self-assessment, not because people are dishonest, but because people are people. Thank you. Dr. Levinson, you worked with several districts in our state, as I remember. Yep. How many, do you remember how many districts you work with? I think at this point we've probably worked with 30 or more. That's a part of you. So these districts, it's interesting because we, we've spoken with some of those districts that did work with you, and they also appear to be quite a bit ahead <laughs> of, of some of the others in terms of readiness to do this. So I guess what my question is, is there a, a preparatory phase <laughs> before we bring in literacy? Or if, do you think we can actually build in the, the, the structures that, that you're talking about into you know, expanding literacy? Um, so I, I, the answer is yes and no. Um, here's what's the dividing line between where I'd say yes and where I'd say no. Um, when we first started, and I think this goes back almost six years when we first started working with districts in the state, maybe even seven. I, I had more hair then, for sure. Um, <laughs> that 
much of what we were saying was shocking. Um, people weren't ready for it. And it took a nine-month process. Of one of the very first districts you worked with, I won't tell you who it is, uh, told me that when we presented our findings, they got a report, there was silence in the room. People didn't know what to say or even whether they could breathe. Because it was, whoa, this is so different from what we have been doing. Um, in the seven years, you know, I've, I mean, we have presented probably 45 times in those seven years. We have worked in, in the different associations, principal association, school boards association, superintendents association. Those folks who we work with have popped. We're not in the same state of where this is shocking and people's breath are being taken away. So I would say for districts, and this will be the hardest part to assess from an instance, but for districts who have said, I get this and I want to do it, I think we can start right in and help them. And I think that is more than half the districts um, in the state. For districts that are thinking, you know, I kind of like what we're doing, it kind of makes sense to me, and the only problem is adding a few more power professionals and a little less emphasis on testing, and you guys got to understand that we've got some kids in poverty who may or may not be on grade level. For those places where they're not actually philosophically bought in, which again, I think is less than half, but more than a quarter, they do need to go through that preparatory work. Uh, that we did uh, with those other districts. And again, I think what we did seven years ago, almost everybody needed that. Not everybody. I can think of a few who definitely did, but the majority did. Today, it's a smaller number, and my sense is that superintendents and special ed directors uh, would be a good judge of whether they think they are ready for what I would call the pre-work, whether they need that pre-work, or whether they're ready to jump in. But I think giving folks that choice uh, might be very valuable. Uh, you have to be ready to do this. Other questions? My name's Jay. What about um, college preparatory programs? Any thoughts on that? One of the, one of the things that we're seeing is that new teachers coming into the field that are 22, 23 years old are giving you very little instruction on how to actually teach literacy. Yeah. So this is uh, both a rent and the art school. Yeah. Vermont is not unique. Um, here is the fact, and this is nationwide, but Vermont is still in that pattern. If I'm an elementary classroom teacher, two things are true. There's nothing more important than my ability to teach reading, particularly to a wide range of students uh, with very different learning styles and needs. That's the first thing that I know to be true. The second thing I know is that I, as a brand new teacher, will have very little formal training in how to do that. Um, about five years ago, big studies came out that said, well, most elementary classroom teachers in America have either zero or one class in how to teach reading based on the best practices. In the five years since that study came out, it hasn't changed a lot. So I don't know why um, the, the, the training of teachers isn't including this. You know that the teachers we met in Vermont want this advice, want this training, and we know that many of them don't have it. Thank you. There's a uh, recent report out from the National Council on Teacher Quality that's now looking at rating schools in terms of the five areas of literacy. And we have we have a range of scores in our state, mainly A and B, but we also have one F, so <laughs> a little concerning. 
Um, other questions. We're, 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 we're trying to get a plan to move forward that would likely be grants that we would be offering um, to, to um, regions to, for, for folks to work together collaborati collaboratively to help. So um, it's not a small task. <laughs> it's not a small task. Um, success indicators. What would you, what do you use as success indicators? Sure. So I, I think there are three. Uh, the first would be what I would call the visible. Did they make changes? Um, and you know, here are just a, a short list of just things that you should be doing and measure. Are all kids getting 90 minutes of literacy or are they being pulled out? Is there intervention for all kids who struggle, not just the kids that you can afford to support? Um, who is providing um, the intervention? You know, paraprofessionals, special educators, highly skilled teachers are reading. Um, those are called the, the structural changes. Um, are you, have you, how many teachers are getting coaching? So that's kind of the, did you make the change? Kind of indicators. That's a good start, because if you didn't do those things, it's just highly unlikely good things are gonna happen. Uh, also, are kids with and without disabilities getting these good things? Because very often we find um, kids with disabilities, while well, modern disabilities are unintentionally excluded from us uh, for all sorts of weird reasons, none of which to the students benefit. Uh, so that's the, did you make the changes? Then the second set of change, the second set of measures would be, are you seeing growth of more than a year's growth among students who started the year five? And the nice thing about that measure is you can actually see that move at three and six months, and certainly within a year of implementing. So you're not waiting forever to wonder whether this is working. I will tell you that the superintendent, when we implemented this, we saw dramatic changes in reading growth in six months in some schools, no change in others, and I think immediately where we needed to double down. Um, and then the third and obviously the most important uh, measure is our more and more kids, particularly kids who have historically not been reading at grade level, actually mastering and reading at grade level. Um, getting to proficiency, getting to grade level can take a number of years, uh, particularly depending on where you're starting. And so I do think that that's a reasonable ultimate measure, um, but that looking at growth, more than a year's growth for kids who started on the year behind, it is a very powerful interim measure one uh, well, that you can expect to see to move reasonably quickly uh, six months to a year. But I do think that there's real value in assessing, did you even put these structural changes in place? Because if you didn't, talk, um, it's just so unlikely that they, all other measures will come to bear. Thank you. So scared to let you go. <laughs> I just have one okay. question. Yeah. Just about assessment, like pre-K through third grade. Are there any best assessments that you could tell us that, like in pre-K screening would flag a kid, and then again in first and second and third? Or a great point. Uh, this is you know in a world in which many of us, myself included, feel that we do an awful lot of testing. Um, we don't actually, on a state level, test enough pre-K uh, to three in reading. Because that's, like, knowing that a third grader is behind in reading, you've already ruined my life. Um, <laughs> so slowly, what you need to do is screen for, like, phonemic awareness. And there are a number of very good phonemic awareness screeners out there in the first 30 days of kindergarten. Uh, you need to be doing what's called benchmark assessments every you know, three times a year. Uh, there are two or three nationally used assessments. Uh, DRA, 
uh, LLI, uh, Mac, they're all fine. There is some value in lots of people using the same one, because then you can just kind of compare and contrast and learn from each other. But any of the major national measures are fine. There's no magic to them. And then schools have to have a way of assessing uh, student growth in a two to four week window for your kids to struggle. Because if I went a month and didn't improve as a struggling reader, that's actually a pretty long time. If I go two months and didn't improve, you definitely need to change what you're doing for me. Um, so most districts, very few states have formal assessments um, created free. But almost all school systems that have dramatically closed achievement gaps um, absolutely use these national assessments uh, with a very high fidelity, hmm. a very fixed schedule. Um, they do it quickly. That's really important. You don't want to. Uh, you know, teachers don't want to spend a lot of time assessing, and they shouldn't. And when done well, you know, these are quick. Um, a very insightful assessment. So with this brings a, a, a good um, question. We are now looking at, are we talking about a screening for dyslexia, or are we talking about benchmarks related to, say, the five areas of literacy that we've just been talking about? There's so our experience is, ben, is that those can be done. You should be doing both. Yeah. They're not separate. Uh, what's fascinating is dyslexia is a very under-identified, very debilitating, if it's not addressed, interestingly enough, very addressable. Again, riddle versus enigma. We do as a nation know what to do. And many of the things that you do for kids with dyslexia are similar. And there's some added pieces. But they're not, I think we undermine both the ease and breadth of this effort, if you think of those as completely separate. I don't want to say they're completely the same, but dyslexia is one way in which, and one reason for which, kids struggle to read. And I think finding a way to combine them uh, would serve teachers and kids uh, best. So if they're showing up with uh delays or certain markers in phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, fluency, as compared to, say, vocabulary and comprehension, that sort of gets to gets to it. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm trying to see if, if we should keep the word dyslexia out of this and just focus on those skills, which actually are identifiers of dyslexia. Um, so I know a fair amount about education, and I shouldn't tell you all this, but not a whole lot about politics. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the question of a focus on dyslexia separate from struggling readers, I mean, there's definitely a political element to that. Um, if I'm a parent of a student with dyslexia, I have every reason to be pretty annoyed that nationwide um, it's been underserved. And I think they want to know that it's on everybody's radar screen because they are a historically underserved group of kids. At the same time, the more you make it separate, I actually think it's been harder to help them. It's been what? Harder to help them yeah. if, if dyslexia is separate and unrelated to school-wide efforts to raise literacy. So I, I think it's how do you make sure that kids and parents feel that dyslexia is on the front burner as part of this work, because I think that's a very legitimate concern of theirs. But at the same time, I think it will help them by integrating it into this literacy effort, rather than having very separate, very parallel efforts. We've, we've actually had a, several um, people in our, our room who either have children or who struggled as well and they, from what I'm hearing as we talk, if they know that the right instruction is going on in the classroom, then they're not going to need, they're saying, I don't need it as much as long as I know that my yep. child is going to be getting this instruction. Yep. And why? Mm -hmm. The teacher knows why. 
No, I, I agree with that. I, the only thing, the only caution, and again, is to recognize that historically, uh, American public schools have underserved kids with dyslexia, and it's not our uh, most shining moment. And, and these were kids who definitely could have helped. There are obviously all the struggling readers deserve our help. Think Chelsea, anything else? Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Chelsea Myers from VSA. Um, Nate, do you mind just making some clarifications of what screening, like pre screening for risk factors for dyslexia is and going through a full diagnosis process of dyslexia is? Yeah, so I think here's why we typically would recommend it's not the only way. Um, every student, because every student needs to read and read well, um, all schools should be screening for struggling readers. Um, you want to, anemic awareness is something you can be screening for in kindergarten. Um, reading on grade level, those five areas of literacy that we talked about, typically can be screened for three times a year, uh, at least K through three. Um, if you're doing those kind of screening, which I would call benchmark or broad-based screening tools, you're going to find all the kids who are struggling to read, um, including kids with dyslexia. So you're going to know, hey, Nate struggles to read in these are the areas. If um, within that small group of kids who are struggling to read, if there are indications of uh, difficulty processing um, sounds and the visual cues, that may be that may be a flag for dyslexia. And then you would want to do the deeper dive. But if you do that more general screening, you will catch 100% of kids who have dyslexia. If we do find that over test, you want to miss nobody, but over testing actually undermines the poor teacher's efforts. Teachers and schools feel like they hey, are just constantly testing um, and not teaching, you can lose momentum. So that's again why we like to integrate it. And I think the dyslexia testing can come separate and second um, within those, that small group of struggling readers for some indication that that might be the need. I think your, your focus on benchmarks, um, frequent, frequent marks, is probably a key. Yes. And I think we actually have, um, that that is a recommendation from the agency as well. So we're building some coherence around that. Yay. Coherence being the word we're using a lot of these days. And I think you know, one way of putting over parent support, and again, um, not everybody was good at this, but when I ran the district, the district I ran, when we gave these benchmark assessments, we sent them home to parents as well. So, you know, parents didn't have to wonder, how's my son or daughter doing reading? How are they seeing growth? I um, think it's a high level of transparency uh, about both who, where was the need and where was the growth. And again, that helps build support from parents that um, extra testing or isn't necessary because they see that these assessments are being done and they're also having awareness of how uh, their son or daughter they can do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. very, very welcome. Happy to jump back on uh, any time in the future to be helpful. This is really important work you're doing. And Appreciate that you are. We, we think so as well. And once we get our, our bill organized and you know, draft, we'll love to just, if we can send it off to you, we'd appreciate it. Great. Look forward to that. Thank you so very much, Dr. Levison. This has been a, a great conversation. You're very welcome. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for having me. And this is good timing. Of course, we just uh, we just got a new draft. We haven't had a chance to look at it. Haven't had a chance to look at it, <laughs> Representative Webb. But thank you for for mentioning that. I uh, want to thank you all for having me uh, here. It's an honor to be here and uh, and have this conversation with you and share perspective um, on where we're going with uh, with universal pre-K. Um, my name is Paul Berman. I'm the director for Champlain Valley Head Start. Uh, we serve the northwest part of the state. Uh, with Head Start Services, which I'll mention a little bit. Um, and I'm also the chair for the Vermont Head Start Association, uh, a, uh, an affiliation of seven Head Start agencies uh, around the state that serve all of Vermont uh, with Head Start and Early Head Start. Um, so I'll start with um, just a very quick overview, not in my uh, materials today, uh, but a very quick overview of Head Start for those who are not completely familiar with the program. Uh, Head Start is uh, a federally funded program. We we serve primarily children from families with low income. Uh, the program's been around since 1965. Uh, it is a very robust, comprehensive program, um, early education services, center-based, home-based, a whole array of services for children and their families. We also have Early Head Start, which is a program for pregnant women, infants, and toddlers and their families. Um, like I said, the kids and families that we serve are primarily children and families with low income. Um, so it is very critical that we provide a certain level of quality uh, for children and families. We have highly qualified staff. We are very rigorously monitored by the federal government that provides the bulk of our funding. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about Head Start as we go. But that's the quick thumbnail sketch. Um, and I also wanted to mention, um, I've been in this role uh, as director for Champlain Valley Head Start, serving the four Northwest County since 1999. Uh, so a lot of uh, experience in the uh, early care and education world uh, with a lot of different uh, partners and uh, providers. Um, and I also have a daughter in college. So I, I am now seeing the full spectrum of education from the very early years uh, through the later years, uh, which, is, which is a fascinating experience. I want to tell you just very briefly, uh, my program, Champlain Valley Head Start, um, I think uh, is somewhat typical of programs uh, in Vermont for Head Start. Um, we are a very highly collaborative program, so I operate uh, center-based programs in uh, collaboration with child care centers in various parts of my region, in collaboration with public schools in parts of my region. We operate some of our own pre-K programming within public schools where the schools make space available to us, and I rent facilities where we provide center-based uh, preschool programming, as well as home-based uh, programs as well. So my program covers the waterfront. We really provide service in just about every venue, uh, every modality you can imagine. Um, for service delivery. Uh, and lastly, before I jump in, into my testimony, um, I just wanted to qualify uh, some of my comments with, um, I have deep respect for all of the work that this committee is doing, wrestling with some, some tough things around the evolution of uh, Vermont's early care and education system, um, universal pre-K, uh, the public schools, uh, the private providers, all of those roles. Um, and lastly, my, my comments today are not keyed to uh, the specific legislation that came out this morning, or the draft, that uh, the iteration that came out this morning. It's really a commentary on some high-level concepts, I think, that the committee is considering. Um, so I just wanted to sort of start with that. Um, and uh, forgive me, I'm going to try to navigate the, uh, the system here and uh, pull up some things as we go um, and adjust uh, font so that I can read all these uh, items here. So I'm going to kind of track through my notes, uh, again, in terms of testimony. And if, if folks want to either jump off or ask questions or I'm not sure what the preferred um, approach is, but I'm open to pausing, talking about some concepts, or we can wait till the end, um, whichever you prefer. But I'll start with an introduction. Um, Vermont's uh, universal publicly funded pre-K program, UPK, plays a critical role in ensuring that all of Vermont's children have access to high quality early care and education programs so as to assure child health and safety and enhance child outcomes around social and emotional development, physical and mental health, and nutrition for young children, all prerequisites for school readiness and lifelong success. Um, this sort of mission statement, if you will, uh, really tracks well with the ultimate mission statement uh, for Head Start, the work that I do, which is really geared around um, school readiness for young children, have, having children ready for their experience as they enter kindergarten and for lifelong success. And I have four major recommendations um, that uh, 
relate to the, some of the concepts that the committee is, uh, is considering with this legislation. And those are the following for the next phases of Vermont's universal pre-K system. First is keeping joint administration and oversight of the UPK system with Vermont Agency of Human Services, AHS, and Vermont Agency of Education, AOE. Uh, and I'll go into detail on all of these uh, pieces momentarily. Keep one set of regulations, the licensing regulations for center-based child care and preschool programs or licensing regulations, this is my prop, for all center-based UPK programs, public and private. Keep and enhance the existing monitoring system, and I'll define that in a moment, currently administered by the Vermont Child Development Division Licensing Unit to assess program compliance with licensing regulations. And I want to pause here for a moment uh, just to explain, when I, when I use the word monitoring in the course of my testimony, what I'm referring to is monitoring for compliance with these regulations. Uh, mon the word monitoring gets used in several different contexts in these conversations, including uh, compliance with the actual actual law around universal pre-K and all of those elements, that's not what I'm referring to when I reference monitoring, I'm talking about actually meeting regulations. Uh, and lastly, something that does not exist yet in Vermont, implement a state-based training and technical assistance system to support all providers around continuous improvement and compliance. So those are the four main points that I'd like to share with the committee uh, this afternoon. And the following, the rest of, of my testimony is really the rationale uh, for these, these, uh, these concepts. So in terms of keeping joint administration and oversight of the UPK system with uh, Vermont Agency of Human Services, AHS, and Vermont Agency of Education, AOE, first, and I think it's, it's well known, uh, the early years are absolutely paramount. Early care and education is important because the earliest years of a child's life from prenatal through age five are the most critical years of brain development and architecture. The early care and education of a child inform the trajectory of the child's life and contribute to the quality of life in our society for our children, families, individuals, and communities. High quality early care and education programs can be conceptualized as follows, and I encourage us to think about them this way. Early care connotes prioritizing the health and safety of the young children that we serve. When I talk about early care and education, there's a reason in my mind that it is phrased this way and it is sequenced this way, and that is because early, the, the health and safety of the children is job number one and must come first. We must focus on issues such as active supervision of children, maintaining healthy, safe, and hygienic environments, first aid and CPR training for providers, and other aspects of high quality care. As parents, when our children are in the care of others, our greatest concern is that our children are kept healthy and safe. And I've had this conversation with many parents uh, throughout the decades, and I can tell you from personal experience, when I entrust my young child, or when I did many years ago, uh, to the care of other people, um, if there can be child development services delivered, that's great. First and foremost, I want her kept healthy and safe while she's in the care of other people. So that's what I mean by early care. Education, for me, connotes child development, which is a subset of human development. Utilizing elements in our field, such as research-based curriculum, assessment, and quality teaching practices to support the skills, proficiencies, and attributes we seek to cultivate in children, such as social and emotional development, language, literacy, and so forth, which support children for success in school and throughout their lives. The professional care and education of very young children is a much different endeavor, for example, than the professional care and education of older children, think middle school, or college students, right? So at different points in the continuum of age, different types of care are, are required. Because young children, first and foremost, are incredi incredibly vulnerable. They are physically the most vulnerable they will ever be in their lives. Um, and preschool children in particular are very precocious. Um, it is an age group that requires a lot of vigilance and a lot of specialized care. And number two, the children are in the most rapid phase of brain development of their entire lives. So the education piece of what we do, the child development piece of what we do, is also extremely critical. I told my staff recently, I said, you know, 
you guys are like neurosurgeons. You are actually setting the framework for the architecture of children's brains that is going to inform the entirety of the rest of their lives. This is the importance and the gravity of the work. And this is the reason that state governments and our federal government sometimes struggle when trying to identify which agency or agencies should administer these programs. Now in Head Start, for example, it is the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It is not the U.S. Department of Education which administers the program. Is that the right fit? I don't know. If, I, if it were up to me, I might actually uh, decide on a hybridized oversight similar to what we have uh, in Vermont for universal pre-K. Joint administration, collaboration, and inspired leadership are essential to bring the best of all worlds to early care and education. In Vermont, we initially got it right with joint administration of the UPK system by AHS and AOE because this endeavor calls for a uniquely blended approach tailored to the care and developmental needs of this age group. Oh, to, I just yes, yes, one. please. I'm just looking at that sentence, and it could be interpreted mm -hmm. two different ways. Okay. It says, you have in Head Start, for example, it was the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, not the U.S. Department of Education, which administers the program. Does the which administers the program go with the Department of Health or U.S. Department um, of Education? I'm, I'm sorry, Representative Webb. The, the um, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is the, is the oversight. And for they head. administer the program. Correct. Okay, thank yes, you. yes, thank you. Um, so, as I was saying, this endeavor calls for a uniquely blended approach tailored to the care and developmental needs of this age group. Mm -hmm. To bring the best support to Vermont's early care and education system requires the best of Vermont's AHS and AOE working together. There is a perception, perhaps true, I don't know the history of this, but I will share what I, what I know and the perceptions I've heard that in the early days of Vermont's UPK system, senior officials from these agencies, AHS and AOE, were unable to collaborate effectively. And to my knowledge, those officials are no longer in their positions, and a legacy of non-cooperation should not dictate our path forward. So when I hear suggestions that we bifurcate the system in terms of its oversight, I think this is the genesis of this, and it concerns me. Collaboration is work. It is necessary, especially in governance, if we are to properly serve our communities. We should not be proposing legislative changes to avoid the necessary work of effective collaboration to serve our society. Rather, we should support the Vermont spirit of inspired leadership and collaboration and keep joint administration and oversight of the UP, UPK system with Vermont Agency of Human Services and Vermont Agency of Education. That's my first piece. Second piece, keep one set of regulations, as I said, the licensing regulations for center-based child care and preschool programs, or licensing regulations, for all center-based UPK programs, public and private. Vermont's licensing regulations took years of intensive work to develop. I recall quite vividly when the state was working on uh, this iteration of these regulations, which was probably 20 years in the making, and it was probably a two and a half year intensive effort uh, to finalize these regulations. The process engaged national experts, local stakeholders, and early care and education providers. Participants and advisors included licensing and program quality staff in the Vermont Child Development Division, and representatives from Vermont Department of Health, Vermont Agency of Education, and Vermont Department of Mental Health. At the heart of these regulations are assurances around child health and safety. And what is critical to me about those assurances uh, around child health and safety is that they were informed by another resource called Caring for Our Children, or CFOC, National Health and Safety Performance Standards Guidelines for Early Care and Education Programs. Now, CO CFOC is not regulations. These are not regulations. These are standards around best practice for the care and education of young children. They represent. Can I just say yes, one please. question? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm also looking at the bells. Yes. This, and how, do these oh, does this overlap with this or align with this or I think it I think it aligns but they're they're actually different types of resources. So the VELs might guide things like the preschool instruction, right? So mm -hmm. so quality teaching practice, yep. whereas caring for our children are really best practice standards around the health and safety of children in care. 
Correct. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, national health and safety standards, which experts believe should be in place where children are cared for outside of their homes. This national resource, and I encourage you to Google it, you can download this resource in its entirety, is a joint collaborative project created and periodically updated by the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Public Health Association, and National Resource Center for Health and Safety in Child Care and Early Education. Support for this project is provided by the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, Health Resources and Services Administration with the U.S. Administration of Health and Human Services. The CFOC guidelines inform Vermont's existing regulations for licensed or registered early care and education programs, including both public and private pre-K programs, and provide strong assurances around the health and safety of all of Vermont's young children served through UPK programs. We should not propose to develop a second parallel set of regulations for public UPK providers, resulting in systemic bifurcation through two two sets of regulations. First, there's no need to reinvent this wheel, right? And there are significant concerns as to where this would lead. At best, and I have deep concerns about this because first and foremost, I'm an advocate for child health and safety, and I've been at this work a long, long time, and if anyone tells you that any provider is doing A-plus work around child health and safety, I'd like to see that because I see a lot of concern in the field, which I'll share with you momentarily. A second set of regulations in my mind, if at best, if we were fortunate, might actually arrive at the same conclusions that are represented in this set of regulations around child health and safety. At worst, we could arrive at regulations which dilute the health and safety assurances for one group of children. A two-tier system is not an equitable system and is extremely worrisome in its implications around child health and safety. Two sets of parallel regulations, one for public, one for private, would be an example of governmental inefficiency and not what taxpayers like to see. Allow the administrative rules process to make thoughtful and targeted changes where needed. A comprehensive work group that included representatives from 32 school districts and the Child Development Division met for a year, 2018 to 2019, to identify regulations in this resource that were duplicative of criteria already monitored in schools and or that did not apply to schools. In the end, there were close to 30 regulations that were changed and at least eight that were identified as regulations that schools should be exempt from. These proposed changes and or exemptions do not focus on child health or safety. Most of those changes or exemptions pertain to administrative burdens on schools, and rightfully, they should be alleviated. This process, uh, the proposed changes or exemptions are making their way through the administrative rules process now. I will pause and say that is the scalpel rather than the sledgehammer approach, and that is the approach that I encourage. Third. Keep and enhance the existing monitoring system currently administered by the Vermont Child Development Division Licensing Unit to assess program compliance with licensing regulations. As I said at the outset, when I refer to monitoring, just to be clear, what I'm referring to is assuring compliance with this set of regulations, which right now governs all, uh, all licensed providers, public and private, throughout the state. These regulations do not enforce themselves. Having the regulations alone is not enough. It requires resources to assure compliance with regulations and the outcomes those regulations are designed to achieve, such as child health, safety, and optimal development. The Child Development Division Licensing Unit employs a team of people who visit and monitor early care and education programs throughout the state, public and private, to assure that programs are in compliance with the licensing regulations. Some of the most prevalent health and safety non-compliances noted by licensing in 2019 include child immunizations, uh, immunization data or reports not properly filed, lack of positive guidance for children, staff to child ratios not maintained, lack of first aid CPR training for staff, lack of child supervision, fire extinguishers missing, evacuation drill logs missing, emergency re response plans missing. This list is not unique to either public or private providers. This is aggregate data for providers around the state. 
Although these non-compliances were detected by the licensing unit, the reality is that Vermont still does not have proper capacity to assure that all providers receive at least one monitoring visit per year. This, this brings us to licensor capacity. Vermont licensor caseload in Vermont is currently around 120 to 130 programs per licensor. Data from the 2014 Child Care Licensing Study indicates that the average caseload nationally is about 97 centers and homes per licensor. The National Association for Regulatory Administration, or NARA, recommends that an average caseload not exceed 50 to 60 programs per licensor. A bifurcated system would provide no assurances that even the level of monitoring which exists today uh, continues to exist for all providers. Developing a parallel monitoring system exclusively for public pre-K providers is not realistic and would not be an efficient use of resources. Vermont should keep and enhance the existing monitoring system, currently the licensing unit, to assess program compliance with licensing regulations and invest resources to reduce licensor to provider ratios, increase frequency of monitoring and transparency of monitoring data, and move toward national best practice. My last recommendation is to implement a state-based training and technical assistance system to support all providers around continuous improvement and compliance. And this system would support both public and private providers. Capa uh, capacity to detect non-compliance is not enough. There must be capacity to help programs maintain compliance, correct non-compliance, and engage in continuous program improvement. I know this firsthand very well because in Head Start, a federal system, there is not only program monitoring, which is very robust, but an entire training and technical assistance system which any program can access. That TNTA can take the form of support around program systems and services, policies and procedures, staff training, and other aspects. It can focus on elements of child health and safety, early childhood education, workforce development, or other areas relative to the work. This type of system enables programs to be proactive in assuring compliance and continuous improvement. It is also deployed when non-compliance is detected to support programs in achieving and maintaining compliance and best practice. Vermont should develop a similar robust TTA system to support all early care and education providers, both public and private. While distinct from the monitoring system, these systems can work in tandem to help assure the high quality of Vermont's early care and education system. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you. That was great. Did you do a few changes since uh, 2.1 to 3.1? Yes. Um, we looked at joint oversight and rulemaking, and we looked at different options. Uh, current law is joint oversight and rulemaking. <coughs> Draft 2.1 is separate overnight, in bifurcated overnight and rulemaking. Two other options were to put all oversight and rulemaking into one agency or the other. And what we ended up in the current draft is separate oversight but joint rulemaking. So a number of the issues that you're concerned about actually end up in rulemaking. Mm. Um, and that they need to be um, comparable. Mm. Um, so I, I think, and I'd be interested to see if, if, if just, if, it's sort of like you, you have to do this, but you don't have a whole agency that comes with it. Right. Um, which, which we heard from the ground, nobody's happy to vote both oversight. I, I couldn't find you the first person. Hmm. <laughs> I could rally a group of people. You could rally yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, absolutely. Everybody was worried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody was worried yeah. about, about one or the other. But, but, but the complexity is we have a program that has traditionally been housed more in human services, but it's also an education program using education fund money. Right. So you get the agency with that. Right, right, right. Um, so what we've attempted to do is just make it so that the monitoring, each side will be able to do the monitoring, each side will be able to handle technical 
support. Yeah. But when it comes to the health and safety and the requirements to run a safe uh, and program that is also addressing the educational needs, then we need to light it up. Right. Well, yeah, you know, I appreciate what you're saying, Representative <coughs> Webb. I, I mean, I've thought about this quite a bit, uh, not just in the last few weeks, but in the last several years, as uh, you know, this, this concept has sort of come and, come and gone. And, and, and a few things occur to me. Uh, you know, one is, um, you know, I, as, as I think my, my testimony reflects, I, I think early care and education is a very different thing than the education and care of older children. And as, as right. And I think the, the hybrid approach, if you will, you know, of focusing on the best of human services and the best of education to bring to this age group, given the needs of this age group, is the most inspired approach. And, and if, if, uh, if you'll allow it, you know, I thought recently, it's sort of, I, I keep thinking about, it's, you know, I feel like Abraham Lincoln trying to keep the union together. Yeah, I, I just, I'm not a fan of splitting the union because of, you know, these different camps and, and, you know, and I think, you know, the agencies are pretty monolithic and I, I appreciate that, but I, I guess I believe in the, in the power of, of inspired leaders to come together and collaborate for the benefit of our communities and especially for young children and their families. So are you, do you think that um, early, if you're an early childhood educator, early childhood special educator, that you might be missing some critical features that you might be getting from human services? If it, if it were split? In terms of training. In terms of training, yes. I mean, this goes to my, my last recommendation around having a state-based training and technical assistance system that could serve both the private and public providers all. And I, and I think that that would be optimal in terms of everyone receiving the same kinds of supports um, so that, again, there's a, there's a broader lens being brought to serving young children that incorporates all the best of these health elements, safety elements, and early education and child development pieces. And yet, a school with 350 kids, a principal, a music teacher, a custodian, a person in the cafeteria, is quite different than retired Grandma Kate's child care and pre-K program with seven children. Sure. No, I know. I, I don't disagree with that. And, and like I said, you know, and my my experience with that is operating pre-K in almost all of these different venues, right? So, so my program we operate in collaboration with child care centers, in collaboration with schools where we're blending staffing and we have blended groups of children, some in Head Start, some in community slots programs that I operate independently within schools, and then programs that I operate independently in facilities that we rent. So I don't want there to be any sort of different sorts of standards, monitoring, and yeah, I don't want there to be different approaches for supporting these programs. But at the end of the day, it's really not about administering my program. My ultimate concern is the children, is that the children are receiving the best that all of us have to offer. And, and the only way I see that taking place is in a, in a world where we are collaborating to bring the best of these agencies together to serve children and their families. And I do hope you know that our interests are also. Absolutely. I, no, I, I, I know that. Absolutely. I, I sure do. Yeah. Just, just adv advocacy. Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Um, just to go back to your first uh, bullet, um, in terms of prioritizing health and safety, we've heard a lot this week about from children entering the public schools the impact of trauma. Oh yeah. Um, on learning and just in terms of child management, behavior management. Yes. Um, how do you? I, I don't know how to say this. I want to say it nicely, but how do you uh, kind of identify children? Because again, the sure. earlier I think we can identify Absolutely. and get intervention and in, the better it is for the child. So I'm just wondering, I know you're probably under the mandate in terms of reporting. Sure, sure. You know, but how, what would be kind of just a little bit less than that, just observing or and intervening either yeah. with the family or getting support for the family because yeah. you, you probably may be able to identify kids. 
I'm glad you asked that. That's an excellent question. So, you know, I don't know how much you've heard and, and how much the committee has discussed this, but we're seeing child behavioral issues today more so than we have ever seen in, in my 20 plus years of administering this program. The, the president of UVM said, you know, what was he concerned about? And it was mental health. Mental health, trauma, so trauma ACEs, adverse child ex experiences. Yep. I have a lot of conversations with folks around, you know, what are the um, what are the causes of a lot of the behavioral issues that are presenting today? And I hear varying accounts. I hear screen time. I hear opiates. I hear parents distracted by technology. I hear all sorts of um, you know anecdotes around what the causes are. Regard and we won't be able to remediate all of those causes. Um, but this is where the hybrid approach to me is absolutely critical. So the direct answer to your question is uh, we're doing uh, screenings and assessments right from the get-go um, for children entering the program. So for example, we're doing behavioral and developmental screenings and assessment. In our case, we use what's called ages and stages questionnaire for developmental screening and ages and stages social and emotional for behavioral concerns. And we're working very, very closely with the DAs with the designated agencies uh, in our region and throughout the state. Th these are some of the reasons that this hybrid approach is absolutely critical, because it isn't just physical health issues and safety that I am concerned about, but it's the mental health issues that you're suggesting. And children are connected to families that are likewise experiencing trauma, have had, and I'm not just talking about low-income families, and I'm not talking about behavioral issues unique to children from families with low income. We're seeing this across the board from all socioeconomic uh, strata. So do you have something where you also work, not work with parents, but develop these really kind of caring relationships with parents? So there's a trust there in terms of being able to talk to them or, you know, not in, infringe yourself into them or impose, yeah. but oh, just yeah. to kind of recognize that someone may be struggling in that. You know, I, I guess it's tricky because in terms of reporting and stuff like yeah. that, but just this, you know, this development of a family, yes. you know, the child in the context of a family. Absolutely, yeah, and, and, and as you said, and I think you said it well, you know, part of, part of our mission, and, and this is perhaps unique to the, some of the work that we do, is we engage pretty intensively with families, and it begins with uh, developing that relationship and developing that trust mm -hmm. to the point that families are comfortable <laughs> disclosing to us mm -hmm. the sorts of stressors on their families and, and uh, what they're contending with. Again, this brings me back to the reason that the, that the hybrid approach is so critical. Mm -hmm. If we're really to support children to be successful in school, we can't ignore the context you know, of the, the family setting that they're being raised in. And again, I don't think it's unique to children that we serve in Head Start because, like I said, I have a lot of collaborative programs where we are serving mixed, aid, mixed uh, income groups of children. Um, and in many cases, you wouldn't know which kids are in my program versus my partner's program when you walked in the door just by looking, but there are a lot of dynamics that are going on behind the scenes. Thank you. Uh, I think one of the challenges with uh, your dream of inspired leadership is uh, we're on our third um, secretary of AHS in the three and a half years that I've been here, our second head of the Agency of Education. Uh, so I think you've got sort of built-in structural problems with with, with that dream. Um, so I think it's just one of the challenges. Uh, but uh, I'm going to try to read between the lines here a little bit, and I'm sensing a little more, uh, you have more confidence probably in one. If we were to say, we're putting everything under AHS, you might not be walking in here with as many concerns. Uh, uh, no, I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, and so I, I want to, again, I want to respond to your question directly. I'm going to start with the I have a dream speech. Um, so I do have a dream, and I, you know, I'm the type of, person that feels like, you know, you don't get an A plus unless you endeavor to get an A plus. That, so I don't like to set the expectations low. That's, that's just to respond to that piece. Um, and I, I really am not trying to favor one agency over the other because I have enormous respect for the work that both agencies do. My, my perception, which has evolved over decades of doing the work, is that really we need to bring the best of what these entities have to offer to this work. In other words, if you put it in one 
versus the other, you're missing an enormous piece, in, in, my, in my estimation, of, of what needs to be provided for children at this age. So that's, that really is the, the bulk of my, that's the incentive for my advocacy, not because uh, I'd rather see it in one than the other. I, I like the hybrid approach. I, I think it takes work, and you know, and I've endeavored to, to uh, support collaborative partnerships for many years. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. It requires an immense amount of work and you can't give up, right? You can't just say, well, you know, okay, you know, we, we can't, especially when the outcomes for children and, and their families are on the line. Um, you know, I feel, and I, I hear you, you know, in terms of the changes in leadership that have occurred uh, over the years. Um, but uh, again, I still hold out hope. In some states, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend this for Vermont, but I have heard, and I couldn't give you uh, concrete examples, some states have actually pulled you know, from both of these kinds of agencies and formed a new agency that, that does contain the best you know, of, this, of these, of these you know, individual agencies. You know, I, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm glad, I'm glad you've heard that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so, so again, I don't know if that's the right approach for Vermont or, or, or not, um, but I do believe strongly in the hybrid approach because, uh, again, I don't think that one one systemic approach um, is going to really uh, optimize outcomes for children. I think you really need to bring both. Yeah. Can I just ask you a little bit about um, funding and financing and the UPK dollars? Yeah. How does that work? So you, the children come to your program free of charge. We're correct. Correct. For the full full child care period, which is typically what. Uh, well, it varies. You know, we're right now we're striving for uh, as much as possible full school day. That's yeah. our target. Yeah. Um, and so I would say Head Start in Vermont and nationally is is continuing to move toward a full school day model. Um, you will not see all programs at that benchmark yet, um, but I can tell you that a substantial portion of my programs are already at that benchmark. So that that equates to uh, five days a week, six hours a day yeah. for the most part, school year. Yeah, it's clear clearly some amazing programs going on. It's a really wonderful model. Um, in terms of the pre-K hours, do you do you take in UPK money? We do. How does that work? The way that works is it depends Wouldn't on... Would you rather spend the federal money? R rather, I, I'd rather spend every. I'd rather gather funding from every source I can possibly gather to leverage services for children and families. Uh, I, here's one one uh, thing I'm sure you are well aware of is the workforce crisis uh, in our field. Uh, there is a very acute workforce crisis in early care and education in Vermont and nationally. Um, and I would say, uh, you know, what I seek to do in my program is to leverage, uh, you know, and, and my funding is probably about 94% federal at this point, so the state funding that we access is a minuscule part of my budget. But I, I layer those dollars on top so I can try to pay my teaching staff a livable wage and try to stay competitive in this market and keep people in this field because there are a lot of people who choose to leave the field because the wages are not sufficient. So if you can give me an idea what but someone would get paid. Or Working for me? Yeah. Uh, if you come, if uh, I would I'm not looking for a job. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, well, I'd have to ask about your qualifications. But, 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 but at any rate, um, for right now in my program, uh, if you're coming in with a bachelor's degree in early education, you're looking at probably about $20 an hour. If you're coming in with a Vermont educator license, you're coming in uh, about $24 an hour uh, to my program. Um, a little bit higher than that at this point, but uh, but that's that's where we've been for about the last year. And you, you, all of your teachers are licensed? Not all of my teachers are licensed. I mean all of your, the ones that... Yes, yeah. yeah, that work in UPK settings. Yes, yes, correct. Yeah, well I should, let me qualify that. Those who are the lead, in other right. words, I could employ, you know, as long as we have a lead teacher who is licensed. Right. Yeah, yeah, I want to make, make sure I'm accurate. <laughs> so one of the things that we're looking at that, that might be of interest to you is we're looking at um, this, this is one of the probably the controversial steps that we're looking at in terms of equity in, in um, the type of program and the qualifications. We're, we're, now that we've been in the program for five years, whatever it is, six years, five years, um, we're looking at moving it to there needs to be a licensed teacher that's teaching. Mm -hmm. um, we have built in in this draft a three year uh, ramp up period which would include that there needs to be supervision and coaching on the ground. How would that work for you? 
for me personally, uh, that's that's not an enormous burden for me in the administration of my program because we've been in head, we've been headed in that direction for a long, long time. We tried to stay ahead of the curve, and this is partly a, a function of Head Start nationally uh, at the federal level required higher qualifications uh, earlier, uh, you know, than the advent of universal pre-K in Vermont. So that was one piece of it. The other piece of it, as I say, is um, we saw a lot of this coming, uh, you know, in terms of the advent of universal pre-K and the workforce shortage. So my, my ramp up of staff wages occurred some years. This has been an ongoing process for some years. And, and lastly, um, you know, I think that this, the, uh, the field is in a state of continued evolution. Um, early care and education is not yet at full maturation. And so these, are, these for me, are some of the growing pains. You know, the professionalization of the field, the way I see it, is going to require higher qualifications and higher compensation uh, in order to really be fully professionalized the way we would like it to be. I think we're viewing this um, iteration at this point with Universal PK. We're not looking at an overhaul. Yeah. We're looking at just stabilizing what we have yeah. and leaving room for growth to yeah. see what's going to be growing organically. Um, that's kind of where we are at the moment. Um, other little, yeah. little off topic, and you know, I apologize to my committee member, but make it quick. Uh, <laughs> what's your view on the on the future of federal funding for child care, not just specifically um, Head Start, but in general? Oh, that's such a wonderful question. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had the crystal ball on that. It is so hard to say. Does it depend on the number? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. And and priorities. You know what we. You know I think what, what we feel are, are. You know I mean I think for you know for those of us you know in this room you know I think education and you know child development and these kinds of issues are a high priority. You know, I, I would hope that our legislators at the, at the, at the national level feel likewise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Safe answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vote in November. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Paul. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah, much appreciated. Thank you. For thank the you. amazing work that had started. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Really valuable. Thanks for the affirmation. I was able to stop in and see you on our tour. Yeah. Uh, 20, 22 facility tour. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much. I will ask you to take off the record people can leave. Uh, but I'll, I'll fill the role of, of uh, Representative Joseph, whatever you would, would ask. Um, how um, how are you doing in terms of solving a lot of the transportation inequities? Oh my God. That, n not well. Yeah. Not well. That's an enormous burden. I know it's an enormous burden. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. That's, oh, that yeah. is a huge conundrum. Oh. And, uh, you know, and again, this is one of the attributes of the system that, you know, I've, I've worked and worked and worked on that issue, and nobody wants to fund transportation for young children. And it really is. Not sexy. It's not. And, it, you know, and it should be because it's, it's critically important. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. I'm sorry, I missed you. I can't remember. Would you like to stick around and cash out? Some ideas for a couple hours? Are you in the home?